truth can calm the troubled soul. God is good. God is good. Where is his grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trials, who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing guys would, let's read our scripture this morning. Out of Revelation chapter 21, read with me. It says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Amen. One day you'll make everything new, Jesus. One day you will bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away, no more tears. One day you'll make sense of it all, Jesus. One day every question resolved Every anxious thought left behind No more fear When we Okay. 
face to face. Jesus, there a greater vision of grace. And in a moment we shall be changed on that day. And one day we'll be free, free indeed. Jesus, one day all the struggle will cease. And we will see. face to face. Jesus, is there a greater vision of grace? And in a moment we shall be changed. And in a moment we shall be changed. And in a moment we shall be changed. Now, does anybody know how many chapters are in Amos total, just off the top of your head? Nine. Who said nine? There you go. There you go. Um, Amos was not from the northern kingdom, so what's the name of the southern kingdom? Kirk, you ready? Okay. Off the blackboard. All right. All uh, right. Now, Amos was a, uh, he was not the son of a prophet or a prophet, but he called himself what? What kind of occupation did he have? Yeah, sh shepherd. Yeah, here you go. All right, and last one, because um, this is the end of famous Amos. Um, I'm trying to think of something. Okay, okay. So at the very center of the book of Amos, in Amos chapter 5, there's a repeated phrase that is really kind of the heartbeat of hope within the book of Amos. 
What does he say repeatedly in that chapter, chapter 5? Do you remember? Seek me that you may live. Very good, Arlene. Here you go. I don't want to knock over your coffee. All right. So, we are at the end of our study of the book of Amos, and I was thinking about this. One of the things that's been fun since I've had the opportunity to be able to join you guys is we've had the opportunity to journey through the book of Amos. This summer, we also had the opportunity to journey through verse by verse the book of Song of Solomon. We've had the opportunity to journey through all the Sermon on the Mount verse by verse, took our time with that. We've had the opportunity to journey through um, Ruth and Jonah. Like It's been a joy to be able to not skip but to be able to intentionally look, not afraid of what Scripture has to say, even if it's hard, even if it's uncomfortable, because we want to see what the Lord has to say. And though we're finishing up this sermon series this morning, next week there's a new sermon series that will begin, and we're going to be taking a slow look uh, at the book of Colossians. And so we've been in the Old Testament, we're going to journey now and over into the New Testament, and it's just four chapters, but this is going to be something that we want to take the time to be able to kind of immerse ourselves in and be able to take a look at it bit by bit. And so next week is a great time that I would encourage you to invite someone, because it's nice to be there at the beginning of things, and especially as we start off this fall semester, this could be a chance to be there from the beginning or kind of from the ground up. Now, we're in Amos chapter 9, and it's hopefully that you are there. Amos chapter 9, we're going to be looking just at the last five verses. And as you're finding your way there, if you're not there yet, is years ago when I first moved to Middle Tennessee, uh, I was in need of a job. And the job that I was able to be provided by the Lord was with a life insurance company. Now, I wasn't selling the life insurance. I was on the back end of the life insurance where People would call in, and it was a very kind of difficult thing, but people would call in, let me know that a loved one had passed away, and that they were in need of basically having the life insurance be paid out to help with their expenses and a variety of other things. And so one of the uh, most difficult phone conversations that you can have with someone in that kind of situation is to be talking to a stranger who is having a strained voice, already going through the loss and the grief of a dear loved one, and then as they let it be known, you're able to see the legal documents of who is listed as a beneficiary. And if their name is not listed, I can't talk to you about the policy. I can't talk to you about the amount of the policy. I can't even tell you who the named beneficiary is because legally your name is not on the list. It's a difficult conversation to have with someone, especially when the emotion begins to rise up the confusion sets in, the fear takes place of what am I to do, and there's a lack of understanding, and then sometimes maybe it's not just fear, but anger begins to boil up of I don't understand, my name should be on that list. And so whether it's a life insurance policy, or maybe it's a will that you have written up, my question would be, is your name on that policy as a beneficiary? Is, is your name on that will when it comes time for there to be a settlement of some sort or some kind of uh, investment to be distributed out. And this morning, what I want us to see as we finish the book of Amos is that for us to be able to receive the abundant inheritance that the Lord has for you in Christ, be sure that your name is on the will. Be sure that your name is listed as beneficiary. Be sure that your name is listed and there on the will. And so, if you would look with me in chapter 9, verse 11. And the first thing that you're going to see there on the screen is just if you're taking notes, you can write there in your margin or in a scrap piece of paper. But we're going to look at the restoring or the restoration of the kingdom of David. So we are going to get a little bit of a history lesson because this may not be familiar to everybody. But let's look at the restoring of the kingdom of David. Look at verses 11 and 12. It says, in that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches, and I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Let me pray for us. Father, as we have an opportunity to finish this book, Lord, uh, I pray that it's not just us going through the, the rhythm and the motions of just finishing this next uh, section, but Father, that we would see what you have to say to us, that we would have ears to hear, and Lord, that, that we would understand um, that you are a God who restores, that you are a God of life, and so Lord, I pray that we could know that, experience that. And if you would, where you're at right now, would you just pray for yourself? I know probably 90% of you had a crazy week this week. Take a moment, 
take a breath, and ask God to speak to you. And if you would, would you pray for me, that I'll be a help to you, and that I'll clearly articulate what the Word says. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. In verse 11, you'll see that it says, in that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David. It might be the term shelter or tabernacle, but essentially what it's saying is that earlier in chapter 9, there's been a very intense and hard word from the Lord that judgment is coming. You are going to be judged because you have not repented and because you continue to be insincere in your worship and you be continue to rain down injustice upon those who are um, not as fortunate as you. And so if you ended with verse 10, this is a, this is a very bleak and kind of sad, dark ending. And God could have been in his right to be able to do that, but he ends it with a word of hope. But he begins by saying that there's going to be this fallen booth that's going to rise up. And that idea of a booth is really that this would have been uh, maybe a small hut or booth that would have been made of a bunch of kind of loose branches, a a temporary shelter. Uh, This would have been something that maybe soldiers would have made really quickly in the heat of battle or to be able to have some covering at night in order to stay uh, sheltered or even shaded during the daytime. Uh, It wouldn't have been something that was impressive. Think of like a lean-to, those of you that have been uh, camping or seen survival shows. It's much different language than what's been used throughout the book of Amos that these individuals were of the house of Jacob. No longer is there a mighty house, but there is just this tiny little kind of brambles and sticks of a booth that, left, that are left remaining of David's house. And God says, even from this just sad display of a, of a home, I can restore. I can make this something that is even better than when it was at its best. I believe that for some of you, there are things in your life right now that I'm not preaching health or wealth by any means, but the reality is, is whether it's fulfilled in your lifetime, but it will be fulfilled in eternity, that you will be able to experience, you will be able to know what it is to have full and complete restoration one day. Just as we sang, one day there will be no more tears. One day there will be restoration. One day you will be healed. One day you will know what that is like. There will be complete restoration. You may not experience some of the healing that you would like, maybe this side of eternity, but it is on its way one day. My hope is that you believe that. Sometimes, I don't know because I wasn't watching you because I was in my own time of worship with the Lord, but I wonder if while we were singing, when we all get to heaven, I couldn't see it from my vantage point, but I wonder, were you singing like this? Well, when we all get to heaven... What a day of, I guess, rejoicing that will be. We're so sad when we talk about heaven and the glory of God and His kingdom. Like, put a smile on your face. Fake it, at least. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is we live almost defeatist lifestyles within the church because of maybe some preference or thing that we want that we're not getting or this or that. And it's like, you have reason to hope and reason to be joyful and think about everything that the Northern Kingdom has heard through the mouth of the prophet Amos of just judgment is on its way unless you would repent and seek me and live. And then it ends with, oh, but there's still hope because there's always a remnant. There's always hope in Christ. You will be restored to something far grander and greater than what you know now when you thought it was great. Or if it's miserable now, it's going to be even something that you can't fathom. Like it's going to be beyond your wildest understanding. And so Amos, he sees in this moment in verses 11 and 12, the repairing and the rebuilding of David's house as a symbol of Israel's greater restoration. In fact, this is even a reference by the half-brother of Jesus in the New Testament in the book of Acts. You don't need to turn there, but Acts chapter 15, this is that moment of the Jerusalem council, and uh, Peter has gotten up and spoken, and Paul has spoken, and now James, who's kind of the leader of the church there in Jerusalem, he's going to speak up. And listen to what it says, Acts chapter 15, James is speaking at this point, Acts chapter 15, verse 13, he says, after they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, brethren, listen to me, 
Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And this is the prophet Amos. He's quoting Amos, what we just read. After these things, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle or the booth of David, which has fallen. And I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. You go, okay, that's great, Stephen. What does all that mean? This is what that means, all right? Just, just follow with me. James is interpreting the prophet Amos, that the prophet Amos is predicting a renewed kingdom as fulfilled in the preaching of the gospel of Jesus. If you want to know what true restoration and the true fulfillment of the kingdom is, you look to Jesus. You look to the one who is above all else. As we're going to see in Colossians just in a few weeks, that he is the supreme one, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. In verse 12 of Amos, it speaks of really kind of in end times that God's people, the nation of Israel, will be restored uh, out of this booth. It, it will go from a booth into this great kingdom. But also, it's not just the nation of Israel. Listen to me. And this is good news for probably, I would say, the majority of us. I don't know all of your backgrounds. But for the majority of us, as we are not Jewish in our heritage or ancestry, we are Gentile, we are part of the nations, that what we find is that it's specifically declared in verse 12 that the nations, the Gentiles, will also be called by His name that all of mankind will be able to know God and be a part of this kingdom. This is a messianic blessing, and there won't be any dividing lines of any kind of ethnicity, Gentiles and Jews together in Christ. And this has been God's plan from the beginning. Sometimes we think, oh, well, the Old Testament, that's kind of, you know, for the nation of Israel, and in the New Testament, that, that grafted us Gentiles in. But don't forget, even in Genesis chapter 12, whenever God calls out Abraham to be his people, it's so that he would be his people and be blessed so that the nations, the Gentiles, all of mankind would be blessed in God because salvation was to be for all of the earth that the Lord would offer. So Amos is saying, when God restores the kingdom under David's greater son, Jesus, both Jew and Gentile will bear the name of the Lord. It's nice to be included, isn't it? It's nice to be invited. I can remember when I was in high school, me and my brothers, we all ran cross country and track. They liked it. I just kind of did it because I liked the team. And um, they were really good at it. I was okay. And I remember my senior year, um, I had the opportunity to be uh, invited to go to a race in Kansas. It was actually one of like the more premier races. And uh, it was an event that if you weren't on the varsity team, if you weren't one of the top seven runners on your team, that you didn't go to that one. You had to go to, you know, somewhere more local. And I can remember uh, my coach and some of my teammates, they came along and they said, uh, Stephen's not in the top seven. He's not on varsity. He's still JV, but he's our captain and uh, he's given this many years to the program, blah, 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 blah. Could he be invited in to be a part of this race? There was no reason for me to be invited. It doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter how much time and effort that you've put in. It's someone who's in authority, the coach, that's going to be able to make that invitation uh, available in order for it to be received. It, 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 you could have as many people intervene on your behalf as you want, but you need the one who's in authority to be able to invite you in. And so the one that was in authority and had the ability said, Stephen, I want to invite you to come and run on the varsity team for this race. And it was one of the best races I ever had. It was awesome. It was great. But it took being invited in by someone who has the power to do the inviting. There is someone, his name is Jesus. He is inviting you into a relationship with himself. And sometimes we just kind of skim over that. And we're like, oh, yeah, I've heard about the cross, heard about the resurrection, heard about these things. But again, in the same way that sometimes we sing about the idea of being with God in heaven when we all get to heaven and we kind of have almost frowns on our faces, do you get the fact that the Creator invites you to come into your life, that He would receive you unto Himself? Sometimes we use this terminology, I grew up with this, of do you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Now, I know it's a semantics thing, and it's a wordplay thing, but I've never liked that language of, will I, in, in, in my authority, accept Jesus? I love that Romans chapter 14 says, 
I'm not even going to butcher it. Let's just go there. Um, this is off the script, so um, <laughs> hey, it's going to be fun this morning. So uh, in Romans chapter 14, excuse me, verse 5, chapter 15, he says, therefore accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. It's not about you accepting him. It's about the fact that Christ accepted you. He's the one who has the authority to receive you, to invite you to himself. And sometimes we lose sight of that, that you are in Christ. Later on today, maybe because my mind is on this as well, and we're going to be doing our small group study, but we're going to be looking at the riches and the rest that is in Christ. And yet again, we live a defeated lifestyle at times. You have the riches and the rest in Christ. Walk away today going, I am in Christ, therefore I am restored into a right relationship with the God of all creation, and so I don't have to walk away with my head low, my shoulders slumped. I can walk away with a confidence that I am in the Lord and that though I may deal with battles and struggles on this side of eternity, I am in Christ. And just kind of as a side note, maybe as a means of application is, in the same way that God has invited us in to be a part of His kingdom, when's the last time you invited someone in to this place? My parents' pastor, he makes this point frequently, and sometimes I'll bring it up, but sometimes we're like, oh, how, how can we grow as a church? How, how can we grow? We grow by you. You are the best means of growth for this church. And I don't mean so that we can have more numbers. I mean that we grow healthily, but we grow in a sense of people coming to hear the gospel of Jesus, and it is evolving by inviting them in. I believe that all of you know of someone in your friend, family, street, or a neighbor, or you work with that do not attend a church, or they haven't attended in a long time, and no, we're not trying to take people from this church or that church. There are enough people in this community that do not attend church. Simply invite them. And this is what I hear oftentimes, is go, well, I would invite them, but, you know, we don't have this or we don't have that. We have Jesus. Invite them to be a part of the kingdom of God and the ministry and the mission of God. Just this past couple of weeks, I was visiting with some, and I was like, we get so, sometimes it's not bad, but sometimes we get so focused on the what and the how. What are we going to do and how are we going to do it that we miss sight of the why? The why are we doing what we're doing? What we attempt to do is to be a part of advancing the kingdom of God. And I want us to be a part of that. So invite someone. Invite someone to our study. Invite someone to your small group study. Invite someone to be a part of a cup of coffee with you. Invite someone to share an ice cream with. Invite someone to share a meal with. And live life with them. And yeah, invite them to church. Number two, not only the restoration of the kingdom, but the restoration of the people to the land. The people to the land. Look at verse 13. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows seeds, when the mountains will drip sweet wine and all the hills will be dissolved. And I will also, or excuse me, also I will restore the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. And they will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord, your God. Um, there's a picture that I want to show you. Can we show that, Johnny? The first one. Okay, so I got this picture from Devin. I asked Devin, can you get me a picture of, of, of an old car? And I, it's, a, it's a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner Superbird. That is a mouthful. 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner Superbird. And this is what it was. Let's show the next picture. And this is what it can become. That complete restoration. Sometimes we see things. Maybe you even see yourself. Or you see a family member that you dearly love and you're like, they are rusted out. I'm, I'm just a mess. If the God of the universe can just speak and something is created, do you not think that he can restore the joy of your salvation? And if you think not me, what arrogance and pride you have that you would say, God for others, but not for me. What arrogance. 
He loves you. And He wants to restore you. For some of you, that's restoration of what you are is you are separated from God because of your sin. And what you need is you need a complete makeover inside and out. He just needs to transform you. And He makes you new. For others of you, you have been restored and you have received the salvation of God in your life. But maybe... Maybe there's some things of where he's still trying to work on you. He's still trying to chip away some things. He's still trying to refine you and get that dross out of you, those impurities out of your life. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, but man, it's, it's good when you are refined by the love and the discipline of the Lord. So uh, I, I can remember uh, years ago the, where I was, when I was in Oklahoma, there was a, there was a man of, in, in my church, he had found the, uh, the, the, the body, this sounds really a, a, the body in the creek bed. He found the, the, the body of a 1934 two-door Ford sedan, and it was just junk. I mean, it was just, it was just a mess. And I'd been to his place, and he had shown me there in his garage how he had restored that back to just its pristine condition. And even with a couple of upgrades, he put some AC in there. I was like, good on you, Bill. And he brought that thing and he parked it there under the awning at the church and people walked in and there was just this beautiful picture of something restored that was once wonderful but had lost its shimmer, lost its gleam. Man, restoration is good. So really quickly, verse 13, 14, and 15. It's all about planting. It's this idea of the planting of fields, verse 13. The land is going to be blessed in an unprecedented way. There's going to be unprecedented prosperity, or prosperity whenever the Lord comes. The land is going to be so productive that the farmer is going to want to go out and sow seed, work his land for new crops, and he's going to get out there and he's going to go, I, I can't because the harvesters are still taking up the crop from last year's seed planting. And he's like, no, I want to, I want to harvest. That's just going to be an abundance. The book of Romans lets us know that creation itself, ever since Adam and Eve, our great parents, uh, disobeyed, rebelled against God, ever since Genesis chapter 3, Romans lets us know that creation is longing, is groaning for restoration. And one glorious day, that will happen. So there's the planting of the fields, so there's also the planting of the cities. That's in verse 14, the planting of the city. Many scholars believe that Amos has the eternal reign of the Messiah the Christ in view, and I would agree with that. The immediate fulfillment would be Israel's return from Judah when they're going to go into captivity in Babylon, that there would be this immediate fulfillment of restoration, of coming from captivity back into restoration, back into the nation of Israel. And even, I feel like I can say recently, when you look at the timeline of history, even recently, Israel itself was forever vacant from their land, and then in 1948 of May, they're back in the land that God promised them, the nation of Israel, recognized once again. And as we all know, that's caused a lot of controversy and fighting. But the Lord says it's their land. But the ultimate fulfillment of this, the ultimate fulfillment of this is going to be the reign of Christ when He establishes His kingdom without end. So verse 14, what you see is God is going to establish peace and the peace is going to come, not because we just want it to, but because God is involved and God protects. And the last thing I want you to see in verse 15 is the planting of people. And, and I like the fact that it seems to end with people because people are important to God as people should be important to us. It's one thing for us, absolutely. We, we want to be able to have a, a different facility that we could meet in to be able to grow because we've, we've kind of hit that ceiling uh, several times of, of what feels comfortable, especially post-COVID, when a room now is about 70% full. If you come in it's 70% full, you don't really feel welcomed, especially in a post-COVID world. But the reality is, is that what we find is that the people are the priority. The people we got to come back to is our priority again and again and again. And so the reestablishment of David's throne is going to be fulfilled when Jesus comes. And this is a little bit of that history lesson, I promised you. I know you've been anxious for it and excited. You're like, when's the history lesson? So in the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Samuel, you can go there in your own time, 2 Samuel chapter 7, David wants to build God a house. He wants to build him a temple. But God says, that's not going to be your job. That's going to be someone else's job. You get to raise the money for it, but you don't get to build it. But he makes him a promise. God makes a promise to David. And he says in 2 Samuel, 
He says, the Lord will make a house for you, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. What happens in Amos chapter 9 is Amos 9 is reminding us that the promise still needs to be fulfilled, that God said the house of David will reign forever, it's going to be restored, established, and Amos is saying, I'm reminding you of that promise before I close out these words. My, my last words that I will pin is that it will happen. And then as soon as you cross over from Micah in your Bible, or excuse me, Malachi in your Bible, over to Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, we begin to read a genealogy and we begin to see the restoration realized and fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. That Jesus Christ himself is going to be the one who fulfills and realizes the promise of God. And you go, okay, that's great, but we're not even close to Christmas. But this is, this is what's the good news about that, is that the coming of Jesus is the promise being fulfilled and realized. But again, for us as Gentiles, that's good news, but how good is it if we're not invited in? And so the wonderful news is, you know, the life in the, of Jesus here on this earth is he lived the perfect life that we could not live, and then he died the death that we deserved upon the cross, and on the cross he took our sin and your sin and my sin, he took it upon himself, the sin of humanity, and in that moment he defeats sin but if he stayed dead, then what good is that? Our faith would be in vain, as Paul says. Instead, three days later, just as he promised, he rises again, and he not only demonstrates his victory over sin on the cross, he demonstrates his victory over death by rising from the dead. He has the power and the authority, and he looks upon his disciples in the book of Acts, and he says, man, go and proclaim this. You are my witnesses to all the ends of the earth. Get this message of the good news out that you can be restored in a relationship with God Almighty. And so the day of Pentecost happens. The Holy Spirit falls upon the people there in that house church. And as they do, God begins to do incredible things. So much so that as Peter is preaching, he quotes and references the promise of the house of David being forever in his sermon in Acts chapter 2. And the people that are listening, they are pricked to their heart. They are cut to the quick of their sin against a holy God that they actually were a part of agreeing to the death of Jesus on the cross. And they said, what must we do to be saved? And you know what? It's the same thing God said in Amos. Repent. Seek me that you may live. Can I just ask you right now, who or what are you seeking other than Jesus right now? You know that, that financial issue that you have right now? Have you gone to Jesus one time about it? That fear of a diagnosis that you have, have you gone to Jesus with it just even one time? That family member who is so far and astray from the things of God, the people of God, and the Word of God, have you gone to Jesus? And many of you are saying, yeah, uh-huh, I have, I have, I have. Go again, because we can't change anything, but he can. Go again. Go to the Lord. Um, I wanted to finish uh, the study of Amos from my friend Parker, his book. Um, there's a couple more copies out there if you would like one. Uh, I'm not going to give them away because... I want to support Parker, so they're only like 10 bucks. But it's a great resource for you, uh, for the Minor Prophets, which is one of the most neglected studies of any part of the Word of God. But I just wanted to read an excerpt as we, as we finish, because his resource has been so helpful for me in going through the book of Amos. So just uh, don't, don't, don't go to sleep, don't drift off, but just enjoy listening to these words. Parker says, I can say for myself that often the goodness of God overwhelms me, and it's hard not to be moved to tears I can be so stubborn, so thankless, so hard-headed, and so stiff-necked that his mercy that is shown to me, which I do not deserve, stops me in my tracks. The gentle breath of his Holy Spirit reminds me of the way I should take. Sometimes in those moments I get down on my face in prayer, but I have nothing to say that can match the feeling of his grace. Again, I ask like the psalmist in Scripture, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you would care for him? Listen to this. 
He doesn't have to restore anything. He would be right and just to leave us rebellious folk to the darkness of our hearts and the wreckage that we make of our lives. Oh, but he doesn't. In Christ, he calls us one and all, no matter where we've been or how far we've gone, to return to him so that he can restore us to himself. In Amos, the good and consistent character of God shines all the way through from chapter 1 to chapter 9. Why does he call us out? Why does he warn us? Why does he love us? And I love what Parker Wright wrote. I don't know. But he does love us. And that is truly a wonderful God. You know, the, uh, the life insurance story that I started with, it is one of the most devastating things to have a conversation with that stranger and let them know your, name, your name's not listed. I can't even talk with you about this. And that person is crushed. That person is hurt. But there are others who are listed as a beneficiary. Their name is on the list. Um, and they know that because they've been told that. They know that because the one who has the authority to put their name on the list let them know you are the beneficiary of this policy. You are in the will, however you may term it. They've been shown, they've been proven that their standing and their name is in a legal document. And those individuals, when they would call me, though I don't know any of this because I haven't looked at it, when they would call me, they would call maybe with still tears in their voice because of the loss of a loved one, but they would call with confidence and without any kind of hesitation or fear because they knew their name was on the list. I go back again. Is your name on the list? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? And how do you know that? I've asked the question to people in the past, and in some ways it makes me nervous, and in some ways I, I, I guess I understand, but I'll ask people their story. Tell me your story. Tell me your story of your relationship with the Lord. As they share with me, I can remember one individual telling me all kinds of things of interesting details of, of, his, of his life and his past. There was no mention of Jesus in his story. And I, I want your story to be something to where you might have maybe a difficult time articulating maybe some of the specific theological components or aspects But how do you know that you are in Christ? How do you know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? And again, this isn't to cause anybody to doubt their salvation, but like the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 13, I think it is wise to examine your faith. Is it the real deal? Because what I don't want anyone, you specifically as this flock, to experience is someone like calling a life insurance company and, and, and you're like, my name's on the list and it's not. Like in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 of where people are going to say, Lord, I did this in your name and I cast out demons in your name and I did some crazy awesome things in your name. I was doing ministry up and down the block. I was giving people water and food and I was clothing them. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And sometimes we hear that and we go, well, I've got to double down my efforts and do more. No, you just need Jesus. Christ alone. Here's someone, and I know we're not the Apostle Paul, but listen to the Apostle Paul in the book of 2 Timothy. He says, For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. He doesn't base his salvation and his eternity on him. He based his salvation and his eternity on the work and the person of Jesus. When you will base your salvation, your eternity, on the work and the person and the authority of God's word, because God's word says so, then you can walk away with a confidence that I am in Christ. And if I'm in Christ, quit bowing my head down in, in defeat and lift up my head in victory because I am victorious in this life. And then maybe the people that are around us would be drawn to something as opposed to kind of the ho-hum, eeyore mentality that sometimes in the church we are guilty of. 
So, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? If it is not, repent and believe in Jesus today. If your name is written in the Lamb's book of life by the grace of God, then live like one whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? I'm inviting you this morning to take the time to do just what the Apostle Paul said, to examine your faith. I don't want you to bank your eternity on, I think so, I'm pretty sure. I want you to bank your eternity on the authority of the Word, the work of Jesus, and His grace and His love in your life. In just a moment, we're going to have an opportunity where uh, in in just a second you're going to hear some music play, and you're going to have just a little bit of time to continue to kind of think, uh, meditate, on what you've heard today, how you put it into action. And then when you're, when you're ready, Missy and Lauren, they'll be singing a, a familiar hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And, and when you're ready, join them in that. And when you're ready to join them in singing that, let that be your declaration of praise and honor to what God has done in your life that you would say, maybe even with tears streaming down your face because your life is rough right now, but you would say, I choose to declare that your faithfulness is great. It is great. For some of you, you may not sing at all because you just need to talk to the Lord the whole time we sing. Do it. For others of you, this is your way to talk to the Lord. It's to praise His name. Because (laughs) what you have entrusted to Him, He is going to keep until that glorious day. So Father, I pray in Jesus' name that in one accord we can lift up our voices in just a moment and say, great is your faithfulness. Amen. If you guys would, this music's going to play. It'll be just a little bit of time, and then as Missy begins to sing, join her when you're ready. Join her when you're ready.
sin and the peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me amen pretty pretty i hope it was true for you um, just a handful of things I just want to mention to you before uh, we're dismissed and before we have a chance to, to be able to go and enjoy some visiting and then some lunching and those kinds of things. Um, in a few weeks, we have First Sunday Prayer. just want to remind you of that because last time it was so good that I want you to be there. Um, I would love to be able to have that room so filled up that... Um, we can't really use the table. We've got to bring in chairs. So uh, keep that in mind. We want that to be something that is a staple of our church, is that we would consecrate ourselves in prayer. And that's that first Sunday prayer. Uh, next week, also, Sunday, August 28th, there is going to be a, a wedding shower for, some, for somebody. Um, and... Um, it's going to be from about two to three to drop in, and we want to invite you to be a part of that. You are a part of being welcome to that. Um, and so we just want to, again, remind you that that is next week. Um, the other is uh, something that I didn't get to do last spring that I, I felt bad about because in the same way that we partnered with the BCM, the Baptist Collegiate Ministry at MTSU just this past week, um, every now and then I have an opportunity where the director, uh, Mark Witt, will invite me to come and speak. And when I do, he, he enjoys if there are people from the church that also want to come in. It's just good for the students, even if you don't chit chat with them a bunch just to see, uh, if you will, adults within the community that are kind of there surrounding them. And so on, I think it's the first Thursday in September, I think that's the first, uh, I'll be speaking that night of the BCM. And so you are welcome and invited to that, uh, to be a part of it. And it's just, just a chance, one, to kind of love on those college students, but for some of you also maybe to see uh, that ministry that we've kind of uh, are wanting to be shoulder to shoulder with. And so that's just in a couple of weeks, uh, if that's something that you would like to, to be a part of and to be able to kind of just see what it is that they do on their Thursday night worship services. Um, the other is we have our small groups launching, kind of relaunching this week. There's one that's today that's going to be at Doug and Janice's place. And again, you are invited. You are welcome to be a part of that. Uh, there's going to be another one that's going to be on Wednesday night at six o'clock. And I was asked that if you're interested in being a part of the group that meets on Wednesdays at six, and maybe it fits your schedule better, um, that that group is going to meet just real briefly right over here. So uh, Tim, Kathy, Dalton's group, just right over here. You guys are going to visit with them for just a second. I think they have just a little uh, kind of uh, flyer information thing just to give to you so that way you can have uh, information that you need. But we just wanted you to, to be aware that you are invited to be a part of one of those. Um, and today, again, or this week, we're, we're, we're launching and beginning that, that study uh, as we're going to be going through the book of, uh, of Joshua over the course of this fall and spring. And so I encourage you to be a part of that. Um, if you've never been, uh, I, I think Doug would be fine with this, Doug and Janice, come, come and visit this one. And you're like, that's good, but I want to also see what they do there. Go there. Like, just because you come today to Doug and Janice's to check it out doesn't mean that you are now going to sign your name in blood of like, I will be in this group forever. It's no, 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 no. You're, you're checking out to see uh, where it is that the Lord would have you to be a part of. And the main point and, and priority of it is we want relationships. We want you to have community, people that you can hang out with and also lean upon when times in our life do happen. And that's what we're hoping that our small groups can kind of be on the front lines for. Um, but guys, if you would, I'm going to pray for us. We'll be dismissed. A pleasure to see you here this morning. And uh, let's go to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that one glorious day that all things will be made new, that all things will be restored. And Father, as we read from Revelation, that there will be no more tears, no more mourning. Lord, that we will have just uh, something that we can't even really quite uh, quite understand, but Father, 
in our relationship with Christ, we are getting that, that understanding and that, um, that experience of what it is to know you uh, and to be in your presence. I pray for individuals in this room right now that are maybe wrestling with um, not having a sense of, of peace in their life or a confidence of, of who they are in Christ. I pray, Lord, that they uh, would continue just to come to you and spend time with you, choose to come into your presence, even if it's difficult, uh, and that, Lord, that you would meet them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.